Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you again to ZJLF at British Library Piazza. We are proud to announce another ses session, Waters of Contention, Asian Fault Lines. In this session, we have Humphrey Huxley, Michael Buckley, Mihir S. Sharma in conversation with John Elliott. Should I request you to keep your phones on a silent mode? And would there be a very important conversation you want to carry? Please do it outside the venue. <laughs> or outside the tent. Um, right, diving straight in. The growth, the, the growth of China, um, which is the focal point of our discussion, the growth of China and how it intends to use its economic, diplomatic, and military power is undoubtedly the biggest long-term story facing us today. Trump one day will go, Britain will settle into Brexit and out of Europe and so on. But China's emergence is non unstoppable and is here for 20 years or more with its effects. Currently, it's in Asia's, Asia's waters that China's muscle is being felt most. Waters in the sense of seas that it's claiming far beyond its legitimate territory, claims that it's embedding with the construction of defense and other facilities with little real resistance from the rest of the world. And waters in the sense of massive rivers that it's damming high up on the Tibetan plateau that will immediately affect its neighboring countries and will eventually impact food supplies around the world. These issues have been regularly in the news as China has set up bases in the Spratly and um, Paracel Islands, bullying and seducing nearby countries who haven't objected very strongly. Most recently, it's been developing a massive one belt, one road international project for highways, railways, sea links, and pipelines from Asia to Europe, linking as many as 65 countries, 4.4 billion people in Asia, East Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. There was a big conference on that in Beijing, which we'll be coming on to later last weekend, with India staying away and Europe and the US not being sure how to react. We have here a really expert panel. They're all looking very serious, which they weren't before we came down here. Um, uh, we have a really expert panel to discuss this and to assess how seriously we should take it, um, China's ambitions under President Xi, uh, Xi Jinping, who has abandoned Deng Xiaoping's dictum that China should progress gradually and should never take the lead internationally. We've got Humphrey Hawksley on my immediate left, an author and career BBC journalist whose postings have included Beijing and briefly India when he was expelled from Sri Lanka some years ago, understandably. Um, <laughs> he's the author of many books, including one called Democracy Kills, which he'd much rather be talking about today, though he's, he's moved on from Democracy Kills for the time being to China Kills. Um, and he's now finishing a book neatly called Asia's War, Asian Waters, How to Avoid a Third World War. His recent book researching travels have included Asia, the US, and this week, Moscow. Then there's Michael Buckley, an expert on the region's rivers. His book, Meltdown in Tibet, looks in detail at the impact of, of the river dams being built by China. Um, and he says in one of his, in his book, China has its hands on the tap for the whole of Asia, and it can turn off that tap via the dams. Our third panelist is Miha Sharma, um, who lives in Delhi and is one of the country's leading current affairs commentators, writing for Bloomberg as well as his former news newspaper, Business Standard, and he's got lots of other things he does as well. He has a recent successful book, Restart, The Last Chance for the Indian Economy. We've been on several panels together, um, and we usually agree that India, this is me, and me, and we usually agree on how India is failing to face challenges and live up to expectations. Um, points that will emerge in our discussion, though sadly he and I this time have not got a minister or a civil servant, Indian bureaucrat, to get at, which we, I usually sit just one beyond me here so that we can, we, we can polarize the guy. Um, he recent, uh, uh, Mihir recently tweeted that Obor is a neo, Obor, that's one belt, one road, is a neo-imperial project, and I've been trying to get him to define neo-imperial, neo but we will be coming back to that. I'm going to ask them each one, one initial question and then go into a discussion, opening it all up to you for the last 10 minutes or so. Um, Humphrey, I'm going to start with you. What, what's the biggest dangerous ch challenge um, posed by China in, com in conflict terms? Is it the rivers or is it the islands or is it the seas? Where do you think the crunch first coming and how quickly? Um, it's the whole thing. 
essentially you're looking at the rising of China against the status quo of the United States. And it's where those two are going to mesh, we don't know. So if you take November, for example, the flashpoint was Taiwan, when Trump made the call, and that caused a, a lot of stuff. If you take last week, it was North Korea with its various missile tests. And then if you probably missed it, a couple of days ago, there was a near collision between a Chinese aircraft and a, um, a, and a US aircraft over the South China Sea. So any of those incidents can cause what can trigger something. I think the biggest danger at the moment, John, is the United States, because we all know what China is doing, and we all know where it's going, and it's made quite clear where it wants to go over the next you know, 10 or 20 years, but we don't know what the US is doing, and we have a weakened Europe, so people aren't taking any notice of Europe <coughs> balancing power um, in the... Uh, in, in the so so I, I think that essentially China, what China is doing at the moment is it's looked at its past 200 years. It has the century of humiliation, which started with the Opium Wars and ended essentially when Deng Xiaoping said to get rich is glorious. Um, and all when Mao came to power, but then it went through that, that sort of difficult cultural revolution period. Uh, and it says we can't have that happening again. And therefore it's created, or it created a, what they call the sort of great wall to the top, not just the wall itself, but it colonized or, or took over Tibet, what used to be Manchuria, Mongolia, and all that, to create these buffer states around it. And now it's building this sea wall to the south. And within that, it's securing its supply chains going from Africa, going through Central Asia, so that the raw materials and the oil that it can get can get in there and keep that country secure. What's different between that and what the US or, or Britain did during the colonizing days and US during its days is that it's not, at the moment, actually going out with any sort of ideology or great civilization or Bibles and trade or anything like that. It's just saying, OK, we need to have a high-speed rail between here and here. We need to get whiskey and milk and iron ore into here and here. And this is how we're going to do it. The, it's been going on for some time, because it's been in Africa and Latin America. But the real pivot to this was around 2013, when it began reacting to the US pivot announced in 2011 across to there. And the Philippines. The pivot, Obama's pivot to Asia. Obama's pivot to Asia, when it said, and it saw that really as an attack on its expansion. Uh, so Xi Jinping said, right, we're going to have to react to this. So he began the Belt and Road Initiative, as it's called now, in 2013. He began building the, up the Spratly Islands and the Paracels that are now essentially military bases in 2013, hoping to get it all completed in time that now it is a sort of a fait accompli. And that's where we are at the moment with it. And what we don't know is what are the red lines that it is going to cross at some stage that is going to create, that, is, that the US Congress is going to say, right, we're going to have to do something about this. And we all know from what we've seen in the past what, three or four years or whatever, a complete, in my view, deficit of thinking in the West of how to deal with these new rising authoritarian powers. And we're getting the same mantras as we had during the Cold War, which isn't actually helping things because China has brought more people out of poverty. So if you're in Africa and you're looking to say, well, actually, how do I get a bridge built so that my kids can go to school? Do I go to the Chinese or do I go to the West? They tend now to think, well, the Chinese are going to fix that problem for me, whereas the West had 25, 30 years and it's failed. And after a year or two, they run out of money and wish they hadn't invited the Chinese in the first place. Um, because the Chinese projects get too expensive. No. I, I, I know what you're saying, but if you, if you actually... He's an old friend, so yeah. we will have, have this sort no. of um, and, conversation. And, and, well, I'll, 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 I'll say, you know, when, when people talk about China doing this, that, and the other, they always say, well, it's not going to work because the state-run industries are going to collapse and because the regions are going to fight the coastals and because they haven't got enough money and they're overborrowed and the currency is overvalued. Flip that round and say, well, is liberal democracy really going to work? Because they have so many financial crises, nobody knows what anything's work, and they can elect nutcases into the White House. I said we'd get round to democracy kills. I'm, I'm stopping you. <laughs> That's another session, another year. There we year. go, right. Um, but, but just picking up on one point, it yeah. means that Obama's tilt to Asia 
which never actually meant much, it never led to anything very much, and it wasn't very consistent, was a big misstep. If, if you're saying that's what triggered um, Xi Jinping into his... Um, in, into the flow of it, events. It, it, it was a, there, there was a confluence of events in, in 20, 20, between 2011 and 2013. It was marketed wrong. If you read Hillary Clinton's thing in Foreign Affairs, it was actually a very substantive piece of thought saying that this is where the money is going to be, this is where the schools and education and the science and technology, and we have to concentrate on this, and we can't continue to be absorbed with these suicide bombers in the Middle East and these places that are going nowhere. Let's link into places that are going somewhere. But it was marketed wrong. Um, Michael, let's do the rivers for a moment. Um, a sketch for us the enormity of China's ambitions on the rivers. I mean, we, we read a lot about um, the South China Sea and the things that Humphrey's been talking about. We hear less about the rivers, though we hear about it in India. I should say that I live in India well, and what, obviously me head up too. And is there any chance, or is there any, so two questions. How enormous are their ambitions and plans? And is there any chance of them being stopped? Um, the, the answer to the first question is very ambitious and the chance of stopping them is zero right now. So uh, I don't know if you probably know about the South China Sea, it's in the press a lot, but you don't hear about the rivers of Tibet. There's a dozen rivers that come down into a dozen different countries. And those countries have been depending on those rivers for thousands of years. Mekong, you probably know that, but you may not identify them as Tibetan. The Mekong, the Indus, the Sutlej, the Salween. You know, um, and these people have been depending on these rivers for thousands of years. And suddenly, China is building not just small dams, we're talking about mega dams. We're talking about dams which are 300 meters high, the tallest dams in the world. They could be six, seven gigawatts, which is uh, you know, a third of the size of the Three Gorges Dam. Well, just to give you one example, which is the Mekong, until 1994, there was no dams on the Mekong, nothing. The French had tried to do a little bit with the rivers, but didn't really do anything. Suddenly you have, by this year, you have six mega dams on the Mekong, and what that does is all of the countries downstream, Vietnam, Thailand, Burma, maybe they're still getting water, but they're not getting silt and they're not getting fish. And for countries like Thailand, the, you know, especially Cambodia, is heavily dependent on fish as a source of protein. And Tibetans don't fish. They don't give a damn about fish. Um, it's against their religion to fish. You know, you've got to kill big animals, not small ones. Um, so, but the thing is, Cambodia is heavily dependent on fish and they have a backup system that comes into the Tonle Sap, and they get uh, a large percentage of their protein is coming from it. If China controls the, um, the upper reaches of the Mekong, then they're in fact denying them protein downstream. And, you know, I don't know if the, a lot of the uh, farming which is done in Asia is rice, which is heavily water dependent. Uh, rice is not just a matter of water, it's also a matter of silt. And then you've got to think about mangroves. I don't know if you ever thought about mangroves. Uh, mangroves are totally dependent on silt. They can't have a mangrove without silt. And the whole coastline of, of Bangladesh, where you have the Sundarbans, and also India, um, that's a defense line against all kinds of things like tidal surges, um, cyclones, which they have frequently. If you don't have the silt coming down, the water level goes down, which means that the salt water is coming in. When the salt water comes in, that kills the rice. And uh, what the solution is, really, is to build salt-resistant rice. That's what they're doing in Bangladesh. They're trying to build GM rice that will work against salt. But that's stupid. Why not just uh, do something about the silt in the first place? Anyway. Come back to in, China's in, ambitions and the, and the rivers and, and the dams. China does not give a damn about the downstream countries. That's been very, very clear from the start. They claim sovereignty over the upstream. They say, we don't care what's happening downstream. As a matter of fact, they say that they have the right to divert the water, which is even more frightening than the dams. Because you have the dams in place first, then you can divert the water any way you want for mining or whatever, they're going to do oil sands, they need lots of water. So in the case of India, two rivers, the, Bank, the Brahmaputra and the Indus. Uh, well, the Indus is more affecting Pakistan. But the Brahmaputra, they've, they've, built, they've built one dam already, and then they're building five more on the same stretch. And they say, well, these are run of the river. It doesn't make any difference. You know, we're not going to have a reservoir. But that still blocks the silt. And so this program is not slowing down. It's actually expanding as they find out how to build dams in Tibet, because Tibet's high altitude, and you need special kind of concrete to uh, build them. But they've overcome these obstacles. So the next thing they will do is they'll start diverting the water, which will be even more frightening than the dams themselves. Mm. Right? Mm. So the ambitions are very big. These are the biggest engineering projects in the world. We've never seen anything like the Three Gorges Dam. It's the biggest concrete object on Earth. And then, uh, you know, maybe I'll turn over to 
me here to talk about uh, the impact on India. Otherwise, I'll be talking for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Mihir, how's, how's India reacting to this? I'm tempted to pick up a question, but I'll, I'll leave it till later. About We've just heard how China is reacting to having been humiliated in the past by its invaders. Um, India is humiliated by, by, by its invaders, but doesn't seem to have the same world ambitions. Um, well, I think it's a little... Uh, um, I mean, it's always struck me as rather amusing that one of the two countries in Asia that wasn't actually colonized um, is the one that makes the most noise about it, right? So China and Thailand were the two countries that were never colonized. They were occupied, I mean, China was occupied for relatively briefly by the Japanese. But that's not colonization, as anyone in India can tell you. And, um, you know, colonization is 200 years, people come in, completely change your society, upend your economy, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, war pitch to your services, uh, 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 to the services of the, of the imperial home, and that didn't happen in 20 years of, of Japanese occupation. But nevertheless, you have a China that is determined somehow to, um, I, you know, to, to reclaim a glorious past in a way that a lot of other countries are, including India, but is also suffering from a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder almost, that demands that it go out and behave, um, you know, in, in a way that demonstrates over and over again in all the various countries on its periphery that it is now boss and that everybody else has to respect its concerns, but, you know, your concerns are your concerns and, you know, we can walk all over them if we want to. Um, so to, to, to return to the sort of larger question of where this means for an India-China competition, uh, there isn't one, all right? And there can't be one because China is four times India's size in terms of, uh, uh, of its economy. Its defense spending is three times India's. And, and much more effective. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's like uh, uh, they are, they are, they are they're building their own planes, they're building their own... We're uh, coming back to the aircraft carrier yeah, later. So, but yeah. um, we don't know how effective they are yet. All right. True. Okay. So, um, <laughs> but, but then again, China's uh, defense spending is one third of the U.S.'s. And yet it imagines right now that it can, in fact, balance the U.S. with one third of its defense spending. And, and that's because you have, to be trying to be, uh, uh, you have to try to be smart about it. So you have to try and work out what forms of asymmetric uh, uh, you know, power projection you can figure out. So for example, in the oceans, what um, China has successfully tried to do, and which India has failed to do so far in order to balance China, is um, if the US has lots of aircraft carriers, then aircraft carriers can't be met in a particular area of the ocean by, more, by other aircraft carriers. You have to face off, uh, you have to sort of confront other people's aircraft carriers with your carrier killers, which are, you know, helicopters, submarines, etc., etc., etc. So for decades, all right, because uh, the US had carriers close to the Chinese coast and in Chinese waters, in their own the conception of what their waters are, they worked, they worked towards uh, a building a submarine fleet, and now they now have 70, all right? And it is only now, much later on in their military development, that they are beginning to build carrier groups of themselves. India was never quite that smart about uh, imagining what it should do. Right? So they never, uh, India never thought, in fact, that it would ever have to balance China. So it started building carriers immediately. And it started uh, or buying carriers immediately. So it has always had more carriers than the, uh, more aircraft carriers than China until last month. Right? And last month, China had two carriers on, uh, uh, on the seas, and India had one for the first time in, 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 our, in our history. And uh, uh, eventually, this is, this is, uh, 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 eventually, China expects to have two carriers in the Pacific Ocean and two carriers in the Indian Ocean. And by the time this happens, the late 2020s, India will have nothing. All right. So. And you've only got a clapped-out Russian one now, anyway. Well, it's not that without bad. Without enough but airplanes it, to come on. It's, 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 come back, come back to the main point hmm. of um, of how India is reacting to these challenges which, we, which we've heard from the... Well, I think the current, uh, the, 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 the essential way that the, India the, is reacting... River, the is, rivers first, and then, and then... The rivers we are not even thinking about. But you've got a problem. We've got... Uh, the, the, way that the, the way that we are thinking about it right now is that we have enough rain that falls within India right now <laughs> to satisfy our uh, needs for, for agriculture, our needs for drinking water. We're not using the rain that falls within Indian health territory. This, this is a first. You, um, you're playing the minister and I'm playing the questioner. 
I, no, I can also say you're that the, playing the India spokesman. I can also say that the, the India spoke. The India minister. The India minister says to his bureaucrats. That's what they're thinking. I'm not saying that they're doing that. They're therefore doing anything about it. All right. I'm it's a, it's saying a classic that yes, minister. Minister, we have no problems with the rainfall. It's all okay, and we can let the China build no, 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 the dam. No, it's not okay at all, uh, John. The problem is that we think that we have enough rainfall, and therefore it's not going to be a problem. And do you agree? It is. That is. That is. The fact is correct. And you write that for Bloomberg. Well, no, well, I have written it for Bloomberg. Okay, that fact I, is correct, I but that doesn't mean that we're using that water properly. <laughs> Humphrey's, I, I, Humphrey's I, itching to I, come I, in. I need, I need to jump in here. I should explain I that Humphrey and, no, Humphrey and no, me here no, started no, arguing last no, night, no, and um, so they're on good form. No, no, there's no, it, 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 it's it's this, like, this concept that India's <laughs> OK, and therefore we don't have to do anything about it. Now, if that's correct, you have a, an Asian superpower that has a regional remit in, say, South Asia, but also it's got things with Japan. And if what you're saying is correct, you don't care about Thailand and, and Cambodia and all that. It's a very, is it a selfish nation? I mean, what is, the, what is the geopolitical thinking about not caring about what Michael said about the rivers? Well, traditionally, um, the geopolitical thing. So first of all, we have tried over the past 15 years to develop a downstream states initiative uh, with, among other people, uh, um, uh, the, the, the countries of the Mekong River Basin. But it's not a priority. And the reason that it hasn't been a priority is because we have, for decades, wanted to avoid upsetting Beijing. And our notion of being a balancing power is, you know, we're not in any camp. And if Beijing declares that this is a core issue for them, then we're not going to stomp all over it. It is my belief, however, that it's changing. And that a lot of the reason that it is changing is because Beijing's definition of its own core issue seems to expand on a monthly basis. And therefore, uh, you know, people will respond to it. But so far, much of our behavior, both when it comes to the rivers and when it comes to the oceans, has been, let's not upset Beijing. Reactive. Not even reactive. It's like, uh, uh, oh, you're upset by that. Let's, let, let, let's not do this anymore. When, when Beijing said, uh, 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 got upset that India was having naval uh, um, exercises with Japan and, uh, and Australia, yeah. then, uh, as well as the US, India backed away from this. Um, and let, I think let, that's you. Let, let's, um, let's not upset Beijing is something that Humphrey and I heard um, in Hong Kong uh, in the run up to Britain um, losing Hong Kong back to Beijing. And part of them, the Foreign Office always said in, in London, don't upset Beijing, don't upset Beijing. And then we had a final governor, Chris Patton, who went in and did upset Beijing. And, and Britain came out without, without any egg on its face, which was brilliant. Do not upset Beijing. Does that stem from the 1962 war? Has India not got over, which is what I believe, has India not got over the shock of being defeated in the 1962 no, war? I think China then walked into India, stayed a few days, and humiliated India by just walking out again. I think that more than well, anything they didn't, else... They, they didn't actually stay. They just walked back. Yeah, they, 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 well, they walked back when they knew, when they felt that the US would get involved. Um, so they, they, they stayed they for just, long they, enough. They, yes. And then the moment that they realized that the US might get involved, they walked quietly out. Uh, they made the point that the, the Indian armed forces were not capable of taking them on. And um, it was cleverer uh, than that, though, if I can jump in. They walked out on the day the Cuban Missile Crisis ended. Yeah. So yeah. this was a very cleverly coordinated um, operation to make sure that the US was exactly. diverted. So they've been clever from the start. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they've been much cleverer than us. Well, that's because, um, in many ways, our foreign policy for many years was determined by a sense that we were, it was China and, and India together against the West. And if you're asking why we have a don't upset Beijing thing, it's because, you know, they want to fuss, surely. Uh, you know, they're like us. They're, a, they're just a developing country trying to take on the people. That's what Nehru the said and what looked what happened to him. And that's what everybody has been saying. But the Nehru, that was Nehru's policy for the first years of independence. It was Nehru's policy and it, was, it, it continued to be the policy of Indira Gandhi and of all the, of all the, uh, the governments that followed her, including And Narendra Bajpayee. Modi? I think Narendra Modi came into office assuming that this would also be part of his policy. And the Chinese have not handled Mr. Modi well at all. They have not uh, given him the respect that he thinks he deserves. And so, you know, when Narendra Modi, look. Which he has got everywhere else. Narendra Modi invites uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the paramount leader of China to India. They sit down to have dinner in Ahmedabad, which is uh, Modi's hometown. Um, and while they're having dinner there, you know, Modi has gone out of his way to try and be charming. Uh, word comes in that, you know, uh, 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 um, 1,000 troopers from the People's Liberation Army have crossed over into territory that India considers its own. Now, 
that happens on your first visit, on your mm -hmm. first talk to your new opposite number. I mean, this is not how you treat uh, uh, any new leader, and definitely not somebody who's been elected uh, promising to make India great again, right? So... Uh, OK. Um, do you, so, yeah, I just want to say something about the rainwater uh, thing that he was talking about. Uh, rainwater only comes down in monsoon, right? So what do you do for the rest of the year? You have, uh, uh, you have uh, ponds. ponds. You, have, you have ponds. You have underground storage areas. You no. have river interlinking. Sounds very um, unscientific. No, it, 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 it actually uh -huh. works extremely well. Well, actually, you know, uh -huh. rainwater uh -huh. harvesting is extremely difficult. No? It, is, it, it is expensive, mm -hmm. but yes. it's, it's probably less expensive than a war with China. And the Indus itself gets 70% of its flow from glaciers, but not from rainwater. Yes. Uh, the Brahmaputra gets a lot of flow from rainwater. But not the Indus. Which is why the Indian the plan, Kanali. the Indian plan, which is quite as grandiose as China's, is mm. to take waters from our south and up to our north. Well, what are you going to do it's about, the, river what about the fish? And what about the silt? They come down the rivers. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think anyone has thought about the silt in particular. What about um, the fish? But uh, fish. Uh, uh, our fish yeah. come up from the, uh, the, the, the hillside. Eat the fish? hillside comes West up Bengal, from the sea. It doesn't fish. go down, come down from you got, the mountains. You've got the fish in the sea. As but a you Bengali, I'm only concerned about what comes up from the sea. Which is so you're going to forget about the Bengalis and there something. These two are behaving like TV um, <laughs> chat shows in, in Delhi, where there are about six people in boxes <laughs> and they talk all over each other. I was looking around to see how many of you could actually hear what they were saying. <laughs> Enough. Um, I'm going to come, having established the fact that India can't do much about China's rise, um, and therefore some, who will? I, I'm, let's go back to the seas. And we, we now need to focus um, on, on the seas and the conflict that, that, that might come. <coughs> Humphrey, your initial working title of the book that you're, you're now finishing <coughs> was How to Avoid a Third <coughs> World War. Mm. How likely is this serious conflict? Well, since the book was commissioned about a year ago, everything's gone upside down. As you said earlier. So, uh, and, um, but actually, having said that, it's, you know, the, with Obama and uh, the Hillary Clinton-Obama pivot to Asia, in my view, was heading us inextricably towards conflict. Uh, there was a, a study done by a man called Graham Allison from Harvard, uh, and he, he looked back on 500 years when you had a rising power against us, what they called a status quo power. And out of 16 cases, 12 ended in conflict. And what was needed to stop the conflict was a real change of mindset on either side. And in my travels around, I haven't found that change of mindset, particularly in Washington. So what you hear, the mantra you hear from Washington is constantly, the Chinese can do what they want as long as they comply to international law. Well, in the Chinese and now the Russian view, that international law is rigged against them in a system that was set up in 1945 under the Bretton Woods World Bank, all that kind of stuff, UN, which was essentially weighted towards Western liberal democracy and their things. They've tried, in the view of the Chinese, to fix that and become part of it. Um, but they keep finding themselves blocked on, on their, the, the stake that they got in IMF, in the World Bank things, in the, um, uh, in the TPP that they were blocked at, all of those things. So they've decided around 2013 to set up a parallel system. They know, unlike what Mahir says, that they cannot step in now. And they are clever enough. Can't step into what now? They can't step into the vacuum and take all those countries with them like the US has. So they cannot become the protectors of the Philippines and Thailand and all, and all the rest. But what they're doing is they're putting their building blocks in a salami slicing way. So you will see, from time to time, incidences happen. For example, the submarines that suddenly appear in Sri Lanka, the Gwadar port that sort of suddenly gets, well, not suddenly, but it gets built, and then, what do you know, there's a pipeline that goes up to Xinjiang. The port that they're about to open in, in uh, Myanmar that leads a pipeline to, to, to Yunnan. Well, we'll come on to the OBR in yeah, a minute. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but this isn't the OB, it's their, it's their foreign policy that they will do something, but it's never enough for anybody to say, right, we need to put a stop. But well, what this. about the shipping lanes and the no-fly zone? It's the same zone? thing. Deal it's with all them? in the same policy. And the, 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 the islands? Which, yeah, I it's mean, all in the same policy. So they will say... But they, America tried to do something. I mean, it flew some jets or something yeah. rather down the... Yeah, so and then China will back off Go into bit. the detail of that. When okay, so, so you will have an incident that will happen, for example, uh, I think two or three days ago, there was a Chinese warplane that flew dramatically close 
to a, 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 an American surveillance plane and went like that around it. And if anybody of you remember of my age group in 2001, there was actually a collision and a, the Chinese plane, and the American plane came down. Those things are happening on a regular basis, once every couple of weeks. Uh, in Japan, up on the East China Sea, uh, there was a Chinese uh, destroyer locked its missile radar onto a Japanese boat, uh, a Japanese ship. Uh, in the Philippines and Scarborough Shoal, they come in when they said they're not going to come in and, and, and water cannon the fishermen to get out despite the deals with the, with the Philippine uh, President Duterte. All of these things are going on. In the case of the submarines in Sri Lanka, to, to bring the India element back, there was the time that, um, that, that, that Modi and Xi Jinping were meeting, the time that Abe or the Vietnamese um, the Prime Minister was going to Japan, something came up in Sri Lanka. It's a signal. All of these are very subtle signals, just like the war, the, the, the 62 war, when they, they ran it during the Cuban Missile Crisis. These things are very carefully thought When out. the world was focused when on something else. When the world else. was focused. So if you look, if you go to the Washington situation, the White House Situation Room, and you've got bombs going off in the Middle East, and this happening here, and people getting investigated here, and there's been some fishermen you know, water cannon in the South China Sea, people are going to glaze over. But each of them is an incremental step. So suddenly you turn around, as we did this weekend, and you've got three authoritarian regimes, Turkey, Russia, and China, all signed up to this one belt, one road. I'm sorry to go into it. Mm. You've got the South China Sea thing going there, and suddenly you've got an autocracy uh, across a swathe of land with, I think it was 29 countries signed up to it, 68 agreements, plus the British Chancellor coming in because of Brexit saying what a wonderful thing it was. So you've got a shift there, a complete shift of how the world uh, or the geopolitics is changing. Yeah, well, one of the agreements that they signed in the LBR, those 30 countries, was that they would respect the sovereignty of other nations, um, but China has not done that in the South China Sea because they lost the case in The Hague under UNCLOS, which was the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, and they totally rejected it, and then they, they're trying to bring in their own code of conduct, which they want the other nations to sign on, like Philippines. So basically, the Asians have accepted the fact that this has become a Chinese lake. I mean, the Philippines have accepted it. Yep. They've, they've backed off. They said, well, we didn't worry about that. The that, Philippines that. are an interesting example. You, I mean, you've written a piece on you, you wrote a column about this, about the fishermen. You've been to the Philippines. Yeah. Tell, tell the story about going to the, Philipp to the Philippines and and the fishermen. It's, it's, it's a 30-second story. It's yeah. an interesting one because... So they, they We're timing this. They, yeah, they, they water cannon the, the fishermen that go to this place called Scarborough Shoal, which is also the Philippines called, called Masinlok de Yaya. Uh, so, and the village of Masinlok is on the mainland. So there's a community of fishermen that are out of work. They couldn't earn any money, so their wives had to go off and get contracts to work in Saudi Arabia and send it back. So the whole esteem and psychology of this community was stripped down. The guy I interviewed, and then he had to ride a sort of taxi seclo. And it's like, you know, a lion tamer being a supermarket checkout. It doesn't work. You know, they, he wakes up wanting to kill himself, and the wife's away and all that sort of thing. So Duterte goes to, the, goes to China. And the next thing that happens is that a Chinese official ends up in their village in the middle of nowhere and he offers to take them to China. So he, they fly them to China, they show them beautiful fishing laboratories and they put them on a high-speed train to Beijing and they give them exo brandy and all the rest of it. And at the end of the deal, they say, you can carry on fishing there, but, and, and, 